Rumor is there aren't any tickets left to be had, but there's been a real call. So, uh, Angela Davis, Amy Gilman, Democracy Now, and somebody else. I can't remember her name. Helen Molesworth is the head of the Department of Modern and Contemporary Art at the James R. and Maisie K. Houghton Curator of Contemporary Art at the Harvard Art Museums. And as some of you know, she was here in Maryland in uh, between 2000 and 2002. She was Curator of Contemporary Art at the Baltimore Museum of Art. Is anyone in the audience a Celtics fan? Yeah. All I can say is, I feel like Big Baby must feel the first day he played with Paul Pierce and Kevin Garnett. I'm an art historian and a curator. Those two institutional affiliations don't always go hand in hand. They're not always commensurate with one another. By that I mean to suggest that in art history, I think feminism has made rather extraordinary gains. And in the museum, there is uh, still a very, very long way to go. And so I'm going to show a kind of funny PowerPoint in a little bit that I made up on a train with my friend, the artist Josiah McElhaney. When I told him what I was doing this weekend, he said, holy crap, what are you going to talk about? <laughs> and I said, well, that's actually the point of this conversation with you. <laughs> And he said, I know what you should do. He said, you should just totally get up on stage and pretend that since 1960, something really strange happened. All of a sudden, white men stopped making interesting art. <laughs> But in the future, it'll be like, like a period, you know, they'll be able to see it in the sort of archival record. And it'll be like the mystery of the dinosaurs. <laughs> what happened? Everything was fine up until then. But it is kind of interesting, so I threw together this PowerPoint, and it was super easy. It was actually amazing how easy it was to just think about a museum of contemporary art that only had works by women and people of color. You didn't even really have to stretch. And all of the big movements got handled. The total breakdown of painting, the movement of painting into space, the deployment of photography, the use of language, the tension between the personal and the political, an address to the public space of the museum as a public sphere institution, the concern with everyday life and tension between art and everyday life. And so I started to think about that great Linda Nochlin article from 1971, Why Have There Been No Great Women Artists? And about the difference between that article in 71 and the article that could be written now. Because in 71, I think it was really brave to ask the question, why have there been no great women artists? And of course, Nachlin is one of the founders of feminist art history. She's a smart woman. And she decided, after doing some homework, that there had been no great women artists because, um, hello, they hadn't been allowed to go to art school. It's pretty basic. And then when we did let women into art school, we didn't let them draw from the nude. Now, if drawing from the nude constitutes the primary structure upon which value will be constituted, and you don't let women learn how to do it, chances are you're not going to produce someone that you can agree is great. But of course, something really dramatic <laughs> happens in this country after World War II. The advent of the GI Bill meant that hundreds, thousands of women and people of color go to art school. And as you know, being in an art school, if you look around you, you will see that your teachers, your fellow students are women, men, people of color, gay people. Those sorts of divisions, the hierarchy, isn't there anymore in the art school. And that's really interesting. 
And certainly if you take an art history class, I think one would be extremely hard pressed at this juncture to graduate without knowing a very heterogeneous history of 20th century art. I mean, you just simply couldn't go by that old, uh, yeah, Carrie Maywee's. Funny, funny, angry, and sad. You just can't graduate anymore without knowing this history and without ha ha it having an enormous impact on the work that you make. In fact, I would argue that none of you in your studios, whether you're aware of it or not, are actually making work that isn't feminist in some way or that isn't, hasn't been impacted by the very dramatic changes that feminism brought to bear on art making itself, right? Because one of the things feminism asks us to do is to be self-aware, self-reflexive, and critical of structures of power, right? Ooh. So what happens then when we get to the museum? Where we know that, for instance, we're not seeing one-person retrospectives of the, a lot of the people who are up on this screen. We're still much more comfortable with your average Jasper Johns, Bryce Martin, Ellsworth Kelly kind of one-person retrospective. And if you walk through the halls of MoMA or LA Mocha or the Metropolitan and the Whitney, a lot of this work, you might see it there, but you also might not. So why is it that the museum has been so much slower to take up the challenge of feminism? Uh, when it comes to the definition of art and culture. And I guess what I'm going to do is just sort of throw out a suggestion that we can perhaps take up um, on the panel or we can ha perhaps take it up as a group during the Q&A, which is that it's one thing to call for numbers, equality, the Guerrilla Girls game, right? We want the same number of retrospectives of artists of color and women as of white men. And it's another thing to make these sort of funny PowerPoints in which no white men appear. But is that really the feminism we want now? Is it still a kind of quantitative feminism that we're after? In the museum, I find one of the hardest things that I confront is as a feminist, as I go through my daily life, in my work life, I'm trying to figure out what does it mean to re-articulate myself and my colleagues in relationship to power. The museum is an extraordinarily powerful institution. And do I just want to enter people who haven't been in it, into it, in a kind of numbers game? Or do I actually want to try and shift the very coordinates of how we think in the museum about how we come to value culture and what kinds of meanings art has and what kind of conversations art enables? And those sorts of shifts, I think, are much more difficult to do than just making sure that there are 50% of the artists on view post-1940 are women. Like, that doesn't seem interesting enough to me anymore. It becomes more, how do we rethink the entire way we might even install uh, the history of 20th century art? You know, what, what might that mean now for us? How do we really, you know, screw with the structures of power? And some of the things I see happening in this artwork, in particular the next one that's going to come up, which is by Dora Salcedo, get at something like what I'm talking about. Like, to take the turbine hall of the tape, to take this unbelievable public space, uh, built on the, on the backs of laboring people, and to run a crack through its floor. I mean, to literally sort of open it up and peel it open. Or carry James Marshall to cross the iconography of the Black Power Movement with Rembrandt, and to just sort of like try and eat away at a structure of power from the inside. Uh, these are the kinds of gestures and the kinds of images that I've been really interested in lately. And then, of course, there's someone like Leslie Hewitt, who's actually not much older than a lot of you in the audience, who's taking pictures of her everyday life, and she's doing this layering thing, the floor, the school notes, 
the family photograph. She's letting them all sit on top of one another and trying to figure out if in that gentle layering there's a different way of organizing our psychic lives. I'll stop there. Thank you. Angela Davis. <laughs> She's ready to go. Woo! Say no more. Say no more. Woo! Woo! Thank you. Thank you. First of all, um, I would really like to thank uh, Maryland Institute College of the Arts for having invited me to participate in uh, this symposium, Observes Constitution Day. I think this was the first uh, observance of Constitution Day I participated in. <laughs> wow, we're honored. Apparently, there was an act of Congress uh, that called upon inst educational institutions to observe Constitution Day. So I think we should congratulate uh, uh, Maryland Institute College. Bravo. And I, I'm really honored to be in conversation with um, Helen Molesworth and Amy Goodman and Sheila Cass. I'll begin by saying that I've been active in struggles for women's equality for the vast majority of my life. Um, so this question, uh, the state of women's rights uh, in the 21st century in 2009, occasioned quite a number of historical uh, reflections. And and I actually want to begin by evoking an image. Unfortunately, I don't have my computer hooked up to the system, so I can't show it to you. But it was um, an image I remember from um, the early 1970s by the artist Betty Saar, um, the Liberation of Jemima. Uh, it was produced, I believe, in 1972 which was the year my trial concluded uh, in an acquittal. And for those of you who, don't, who may not know, um, I, I was in jail on charges of murder, kidnapping, and conspiracy for a couple of years, uh, facing the death penalty. Um, and some of my students said, uh, one way I mentioned I've been, I was in jail. You were in jail. <laughs> so I just want to put it out there. <laughs> if you want, you can Google the image, the liberation of uh, Aunt uh, Jemima, and you'll see that it's uh, a black doll, stereotypical mammy doll, placed in front of uh, a series of Aunt Jemima pancake boxes. And the doll holds a broom in one hand, and a rifle in another. And in a sense, it represented much of what had gone unarticulated within the black, what we call then the Black Liberation Movement, uh, and what had gone unarticulated in what we call the Women's Liberation Movement. And I recall that in 1972, many of us were really dissatisfied with the failure of the black movement then to pay serious attention to women's issues. But with some exceptions, we did not think we would discover the solution to this dilemma in the women's movement. Uh, um, about 10 years or so later, uh, a, a group of uh, uh, black feminists edited an anthology called All the, All the, All the Men Are Black, All the all the women are white, all the men are black, but some of us are brave, right? All the women are white, 
All the blacks are men. That's it. <laughs> but some of us are brave. I mention this uh, because um, as, I, as I look at my own work today, so much of my own work, scholarly and activist work, is enabled by and is directly tied to feminist theories and practices. And at that time, I was extremely reluctant to identify with feminism. In fact, it wasn't until around 1981 that I began to refer to myself as a, a feminist. Uh, I, I published a book in 1981 called Women, Race, and Class. And so I began to be referred to as a feminist and had to grapple with uh, what it might mean to identify into feminism. Now, also the year that, that marks the emergence of what we often refer to as women of color feminism. Uh, 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 this Bridge Called My Back was published in 1981. There were important conferences. Uh, we could actually spend the rest of my 15 minutes talking about 1981, but I want to go on to the, uh, the, the message of what we call women of color feminism. We can never assume that the category women equally represents all women. Mm -hmm. So we pointed to hierarchies of race and class. And now that we've begun to challenge the binary assumptions around gender, we have to say hierarchies of gender as well. I mean, where, for example, does a transgender woman figure into that hierarchy? I learned many years ago that when we were attempting to understand modes of discrimination and oppression, it was helpful to look at those who were considered to be lowest uh, on the ladder, lowest in the structure of oppression. Don't measure progress with respect to women in relation to the number of women who have become CEOs or who have almost become president. <laughs> but measure the progress with respect to those who were much worse off to begin with. Mm -hmm. So I want us to think about how much progress has been achieved, for example, for women in prison. Uh, New York recently, about a week and a half ago, passed a law prohibiting the shackling of women in labor. Oh my God. Yeah. And it's the only the sixth state to have passed such a law. Some of you may know that Amnesty International for the last uh, 10 years or so has been conducting uh, a campaign to prohibit the shackling of, 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 of pregnant women during labor. We could talk about the women in prison and the extent to which um, institutional violence gets overlaid with and is cross-hatched with intimate violence. So, you know, one of the really important accomplishments of the women's movement, the feminist movement over the years, is that we now acknowledge that violence against women is a pandemic all over the world. But we tend to think about violence against women only in terms of, of individual perpetrators. Uh, so we tend to think largely in terms of intimate violence, domestic violence, uh, and we don't necessarily think about the relationship between institutional violence and structural violence and that intimate violence, and so therefore, we assume that the only thing we can do to someone who has committed violence against women is to put them into prison, right? Sentence them to prison. And, and in the meantime, the cycle of violence continues. Uh, uh, it does not, I, I guess I should say that I'm speaking here as a prison abolitionist as well. <laughs> 
um, but I think it's been really important in relation to the feminist movement over the uh, last years is that we've been able to at least begin to grapple with some of these really hard questions. Uh, if you are a prison abolitionist, how can you say that someone who has committed an act of violence against a woman should not be sent to prison? Um, well, perhaps we can talk about that, mm -hmm. uh, you know, during the conversation. So I'll, I'll conclude by saying what I hope we will discuss over the next uh, 45 minutes after Amy Goodman's uh, presentation, which, uh, uh, you know, will be absolutely fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> I know we all depend on Amy for our <laughs> I really hope we will um, talk a bit about um, transgender issues. Uh, and I say this knowing that recently in the news uh, mm -hmm. was the case of Casta uh, Semenya, the South African athlete, uh, who has been uh, the target of so uh, much, uh, so many vicious assaults. Uh, uh, and you know what? What does what does what does that mean? Uh, uh, the, the, do we say that there's this clean line of gender division that all the women stand on one side and all the men on the other? Well, all those boxes that we, we check assume that that is the case. Uh, if you look at the structure of, 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 of uh, imprisonment in, in this country, uh, there are only women's prisons and there are men's prisons, right? So what happens to a person a transgender person or a gender non-conforming person. So I think that we need to take into consideration the, the gendering apparatuses uh, that uh, uh, we might uh, consider the major institutions of our society. Because I'm sure every one of you who apply here, you have to check the box, right? You have to say whether you were F or M, right? Yeah. I, I hope we will discuss the importance of health care reform uh, for all women in this country. And we know that that debate is, is, is raging now, and we cannot, uh, we do not want to see a watered down, we should actually have a single payer system. I mean all women in this country. I mean women in prison. I mean women who are immigrants without documents, uh, who have been uh, locked up by ICE. And I get very angry when, uh, when Obama feels that it's necessary constantly to reply to the right wing by saying, no, this, this self-care reform is not supposed to benefit, quote, illegal uh, immigrants. Uh, I mean, everybody in this country is an immigrant, with the exception of indigenous people. So, <laughs> and one of the things I think we should do, I, I, I actually learned this um, in Australia, and I, I try to do it sometimes in this country, is to acknowledge the um, traditional, uh, the, 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 the traditional land owners, those who uh, uh, first inhabited this land uh, we have now taken over. Uh, I hope we discuss the, the wage gap, because yeah, we've made a lot of progress, but women still make only 78 cents on the dollar. Uh, the Lily Ledbetter Fair Pay Act was a really good beginning, and uh, we should congratulate the Obama um, administration, congratulate Obama for having symbolically chosen that as the very first act uh, uh, he signed after 
he was elected to office. This was a very good beginning, but we still have a very, very long way to go. And so let me say finally that uh, I, I absolutely agree with, um, with Helen Mill's work. Uh, feminism, yes, feminism is concerned with women. Feminism is concerned with gender. Feminism is concerned with sexuality. Feminism is concerned with race. Uh, but there may be something more important than the objects of our, our concern. Uh, feminist methodologies for research, for organizing, impel us to explore contradictions that are not always apparent. They drive us to inhabit those contradictions and discover what is productive in those, uh, in those con contradictions. Uh, I see feminism as providing methods of thought and action that urge us to think things together that appear to be entirely separate and to disarticulate or disaggregate things that appear to belong naturally um, together. And therefore, uh, the example that I gave before, violence against women is so much more complicated than we thought. Uh, uh, sexual assault, uh, do domestic violence, uh, have their public and institutional faces as well as their uh, uh, what we might call privatized uh, faces. Uh, I, um, on the way to my hotel uh, last night, but early this morning at about 2 o'clock this morning, my plane got in really late last night. Uh, I passed by the, the YWCA. And you know the YWCA, it's a really good organization. Did you know that? <laughs> For a very long time, their slogan has been eliminating racism, empowering women. They have recognized that it is not possible to empower women without eliminating racism. And it is not possible to eliminate racism without empowering women. And so I want us to be able to think all of these things together. We, we can't assume that there is this special category uh, called women, and then who do we get to represent that, uh, you know, Perhaps if we were able to choose, a, um, say, a Native American woman in prison uh, to you know, serve as the example of our category of uh, women, we'd be in better shape. Uh, but we don't usually do that. So we, we have to uh, develop these, the, these habits of thinking through contradictions and thinking uh, things together that normally appear to belong um, um, apart. Uh, so thank you very much for having uh, uh, listened to my rantings, and I look forward to a wonderful conversation. Thank you. Thank you for laying out the agenda. We have a lot, to, we have a lot more we need to talk about before we get to hear from Amy Goodman. to follow two such incredible, creative, thinking outside the box women, Helen and Angela. And I want to dedicate this to my greatest role model, my mom. Um, I just left her hospital bed a few hours ago to come be with you. And I want to thank my brother, Steve, and <laughs> who teaches over Johns Hopkins, who took the train up this morning to be with her so I could be with you, because she insisted I be with you. My mom, who has taught me so much throughout my life, uh, and her mom, my grandmother, who lived to be 108, and uh, was ferocious right until the end. And when I told that story at some event, a woman came up and said, oh my gosh, I just celebrated my grandmother's 106th birthday. And she said, my grandmother got up at her party and said, oh, to be 100 again. <laughs> Can you relate to that? <laughs> So, 
that's what me and my three brothers are working to ensure that my mother will be doing when she's 106 right now. It's a tough road to hoe, and we're all uh, gathering our forces together and uh, standing at the hospital door, um, making sure that those doctors do no harm. Uh, which, any of you, um, and there are wonderful doctors and nurses and health professionals, and, um, but we have to fix the system. It's destroying us all, and we have to recognize that there is a terrible problem. My mom, for years, uh, taught women's literature and history. She taught me the word feminism at local community colleges where we grew up. She taught it to truck drivers and firefighters and police officers, anyone who wanted some extra credits to get a higher salary. They'd come at night and she'd take out Toni Morrison and Virginia Woolf and they'd read together and they'd start taking these books home. And then she'd find she'd have to get a few more chairs at the next class because, well, one of the firefighters would bring his wife and one of the truck drivers would bring his daughter. And by the end of class, at the end of each semester, it was a family affair. Yes, the entire village would be there. Husbands and fathers and brothers starting to understand, and this was in the 1970s, what their wives, daughters, grandmothers, aunts were talking about, were so upset about. I had done my thesis in medical anthropology on a contraceptive drug called Depo-Provera. Um, Depo was not approved by the FDA at the time. Somehow it got approved over these decades. But when I did my thesis in, I think it was 1984, it would cause cancer in dogs and monkeys. I would guess it still does. But, and it was sent all over the world. At the time, it was the Upjohn Pharmaceutical Company based in Kalamazoo, Michigan. And, sent to more than 70 countries, women would be injected with this drug. It's just an artificial progesterone injected into the arm every three months. And you know the studies would say millions of women hours of tests have been done. But that wasn't millions of women, um, or rather it wasn't uh, millions of uh, hours, months, years following particular women. It was a million women for one hour. They'd come in from the mountains, they'd be shot up, and they'd never see them again. So what kind of study was that? What were we exporting to the rest of the world? We know, for example, the drug testing of the pill. That was on women in Puerto Rico getting massive doses of estrogen before they got it right, how many of those women got sick. So I was looking at Tupperware, and I couldn't afford, though I was in anthropology, uh, to go to other places in the world uh, to do my thesis. So I decided to look right here at home, what was happening in the United States, which certainly brought me to the women's health movement at that time. Was depo used here? It couldn't be, right, because it wasn't approved by the FDA. Yeah, the real question is, well, then why could they dump it abroad? But no, it was used here. It was injected into 10,000 black women in Atlanta, Georgia, at the Grady Memorial Hospital, Charity Hospital. It was the beginning of the Black Women's Health Project. Billy Avery ran that project because women were getting sick. This is the healthiest time for women, you know, uh, in their 20s and their 30s and their teens. Why are they getting sick? So they started to band together. Movements are so important, and I hope that's a theme of everything that we talk about today. And these women didn't know this drug wasn't approved. They didn't know that they were guinea pigs, that they were human beings, that they were women who were taking a drug so that they could control their lives. They didn't know when they flipped through the Grady Hospital uh, uh, Family Planning Clinic when it said the shot that that wasn't approved by the FDA and that they were being experimented on. And that's what I looked at. I was looking at women in our own country. So um, I did the thesis and I was so excited to be leaving college, but I had to defend it first. Uh, my thesis advisor, interestingly enough, um, I went outside my school to Laura Nader, who is Ralph Nader's sister, who's a great anthropologist at the University of California, Berkeley. And we used to walk together for hours as I talked about my research. She couldn't come, though, to my thesis defense. So it was in front of three white male anthropologists, professors. Um, 
at an elite university and they looked at me and one of them pushed the thesis back to me. I mean, I was leaving in a few weeks and he said, I'm sorry, we can't accept this in anthropology. I said, why not? <laughs> I'm like, I'm out of here. I had better graduate. And he said, well, this isn't a thesis in anthropology. I said, what do you mean? And so he said, do you know the definition of anthropology? And I thought, well, if I'm going to leave here and pass, I better have the same definition as him. So I threw the question back at him, and I said, well, what do you think is the definition of anthropology? <laughs> took a drag of his pipe, and he said, anthropology is looking as a participant observer in someone else's culture, and that gives you a kind of distance where you can see what's going on. He said, if anything, this is sociology as you look at your own culture, and I said, oh, actually, I totally agree with you that that is what we do in anthropology. Uh, we you know, go into a culture, not our own, and we look at it with that distance. And that's exactly what I was doing as I looked at women and science and the burden of proof. I was looking at the scientific cultural establishment in this country, in the United States, white, male, corporate culture, that I don't consider myself a part of. I was looking at you. <laughs> Drag of that pipe, and he said, Carry on. <laughs> but I was looking at movements even then, movements that were protecting women at that time. It's helping so important the reproductive rights movement, and also realizing that this wasn't going to help these three men, what I learned about Deco Rivera. And Understanding the power of the media, how important it is we get information out, no matter what you do, that you share it. Uh, and so I turned it into a series of articles with a colleague for the multinational monitor called The Case Against Deborah Provera, so that women would be armed with information. And this is really the power of independent media, so that you can make up your own minds. It's not telling you what to think. A place where we can debate and discuss the most important issues of the day. War and peace, life and death. And anything less than that is a disservice. Those men and women on military bases, they can't have these debates about whether we go to war in Iraq and Afghanistan. No, they rely on us in civilian society to have these critical discussions about whether they live or die, whether they're sent to kill or be killed. Anything less than that is a disservice to a democratic society. And I think about the hope, the movements of the past and where we are today, the movements of the past. Here we are in Maryland, and I think of Frederick Douglass. I don't know if you know the story. I've often told it, especially in Maryland, because I'm so amazed by it. But he was enslaved, and he wouldn't surprise you know he was a troublemaker. And so he's handed over to a man called a slave breaker named Edwin Covey, and his property was called Mount Misery. And he was tortured there. He was beaten there, but he broke away. He headed north, and he changed the world. And by the way, how did he do it? North Star newspaper. He saw the media as his salvation. When in New York, I go to an old coffee shop that's actually in the old printing press of a man named David Ruggles, a born a free black man in Connecticut. He had a printing press. The media is power. The media is liberation when we're able to get information, and they saw it that way then. Um, that property to his own distance, it's no distance. You're not in it alone. You come from a remarkable history, and you can make history as you move forward together. Which brings me on this day, we talk about women to two young women we had on Democracy Now! just a few years ago, and I do think this is the hope. Their names are Mari Oy and Leah Anthony Labresco, and we had them on because they were presidential scholars uh, a couple years ago. They were high school seniors who, along with Oh, about 150 other high school seniors were chosen to come to Washington and meet the President of the United States. It was, it's a very big deal each year. And Leah was from New York, and Mari is from Wellesley High in uh, Massachusetts. And they were representing their states, and Mari realized the night before the meeting, it was with President Bush, that, wow, this was a big moment. This is a moment that 
probably many people would love to share with the President of the United States to get to say a few words to him and what was she going to do with her few moments. So she stayed up all night and she gathered the other presidential scholars around and they decided to write him a letter and a third of the presidential scholars signed it. That's 50 of 150. Said that the way the rest of your liar of smart kids with something up their sleeve, she was afraid someone would look down and he looked up and he wasn't smiling anymore. And he said, we do not torture. And he looked down, he looked up and he said, we do not torture. And Mari said, then will you unsign the signing statement you signed when you signed the McCain anti-torture bill? No, no, if you anti-torture bill. And then a boy from Montana, presidential scholar, raised his hand and said, we don't have to represent torture to the rest of the world. So that was their moment. And Leia, well, she still had that letter, so she pulled it out and she gave it to the press. And that's how we learned of her story. And Mari called her mom. She was so excited. The parents weren't there. Her mom was in the last room of the Holocaust Museum. And she walked out into the sunlight with her uh, face um, with her majority, but the silenced majority, silenced by the corporate media, which is why we have to take it back. Democracy. <laughs>
produces nuance. Cannibalism transitions smoothly into arenas of culture formation motivated by hard sciences, including those new forms' reliance on electronic subtlety reduction. It has no end. Only one gang at a time. Clearing throats. Ladders. and enterprise as the engine 
of America's citizens of any other country, rugged people with a healthy thread running through our belief that we are all our first president, Abraham Lincoln, that through government we should do together what we cannot do to keep us secure, to educate our railroads, highways, and commerce. We've supported, unleashed, and repeated countless new jobs and entire industries, benefited from investments, and connected each one of us to ourselves and to programs like a lifetime of insurance, which protects us against millions of poor children of commitments. I'll go further. We would not be a great nation without those commitments. We cannot ignore the typical middle class accountant so that both lower rates and competitive speeds make even greater incentive for us to act boldly instead of kicking America within our future. Even from the National Recovery Increase Foundation history, the noble endeavor to better our explosion when setting America's sights on hope, this will to ignite new energy, to secure our children, composed mostly of critical investments, which also includes recruits like the ones in Columbus, Ohio, who were told that sworn officers were not like focused on everything on the table, will need a phased-in vision 20 years down the road, championed and embraced by worthy goals, fundamentally different from the ones we've known throughout most of our education. 30% will grow to 50% when you're trying to afford a vision of roads. Bridges collapse if there are bright young outpacing our science infrastructure for high-priced seniors. Ten years from now, instead of guaranteed grandparents who require 24-hour tax breaks for people like me, like me, asking for opportunity and light communities, shrouded in college with social breakthroughs in sacrifice and balanced airports, we will compete with wasteful efficiency and speed the number of days with new incentives for results and we will independent mission of experts and editors and recommend access to additional decades. And if we're wrong, if we're wrong, the independent commission will make additional senior additional seniors to pay for rising families with
Dedicated to the work of Mauricio Cago. Thanks for coming. And uh, thanks to Henry and uh, the Andy Music. Sean, what do we all do for Anacors? <laughs> <laughs> uh, we can turn the jukebox back on. <laughs> <laughs> we got these, we got these sheep lying around. <laughs> <laughs> Sean, 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 Sean,